You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. everybody. Happy Monday. Excited to have this conversation with you. We're going to get the opportunity to talk with Bonnie from 43bluedoors.com. And to set the frame for why this episode is going to have so much value for you, we got a chance to learn a little bit more about Bonnie's story and just highlighted this fascinating journey that she's been on to reach financial independence and really had to work through some instances and some very specific situations that I think are going to be very relatable to many people in our audience In particular, one of the things that really struck out to me is not everybody pursues this path with an incredibly high income. It's not a prerequisite to reach financial independence. Not everybody pursues this path because their life just went perfectly. The the hope and the optimism that comes through with Bonnie's story is that regardless of your income level and regardless of your time in life when you found out about this concept, there is a path for you to reach financial independence, and she is proof of that. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing quite well. Yeah, I'm, I've been looking forward to this. Actually, what's really interesting is Bonnie met my brother Scott down in Santiago, Chile. She said it was her first FI in real life meetup, and she got to hang out with Scott, and he emailed me and said, man, you have to have Bonnie on the podcast. She would be perfect. And yeah, as we dove into her story... It has a little bit of everything, and I'm just really excited to bring her to the FI community here. So with that, Bonnie, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for that great intro. You know, Bonnie, as we were kind of learning more about your story, one of the things that stood out to me, you said, I grew up in a home whose total income was half the poverty level. And then you told us in, you know, in this kind of intro a little bit about your experience, and I'd love for you to kind of share that with the audience. How did that upbringing set a path for some of your earlier years? Yeah. So growing up, my family never really earned a whole lot of money. In fact, according to the government, it was half a poverty level. The thing about it is my parents were always debt free. They knew how to handle their money, even though there was only a little bit of it. We always had a roof over our head, food to eat and heat and house. Uh, We just didn't have any extras. We never felt, I never felt poor growing up, even though there wasn't money for any extras. I think that that really helped set the precedence of money was just a tool. It wasn't this huge necessity for a good life because we had everything we needed. I also knew from a young age that I'd have to pay for my own college and I wanted to go to college. So I started at 14, all kinds of odd jobs, anything from mowing lawns to making wedding cakes and whatever I could because it was my goal to get out debt free. That was the one thing that my parents always drilled into us borrower servant to the lender. So I didn't want debt. I wanted to pay cash for everything. So that's was my background growing up. All right, Bonnie, you said when you grew up that your family income was less than half the poverty level, but that you didn't feel poor. Your parents never had debt. So I mean, they clearly, they, they knew what they were doing financially, but were there ever any overt lessons in the house about finances? Or, or how did you grow up knowing about anything financially? You said you knew you had to save every penny for college and pay for it yourself, but but were there lessons from your parents? It, we never really talked about money. I think my parents didn't want us to worry that they didn't have any money. I think I learned finances from Monopoly and from Proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> my sister and I love to play Monopoly. Do not pass a, go. Do not collect yes. $200. <laughs> you know, we lived in a little town of 35 people. You know, there was only so much to to do. But um, I learned, you know, if you get a monopoly, then your ROI was better after four houses. And honestly, I I learned a lot from that. And then from just, uh, you know, Proverbs, borrower, servant to the lender, you know, wise man stores up, you know, things like that. But as far as overtly talking about money, we, we really didn't talk a whole lot about money. All I knew is work hard, 
and don't spend a lot of money. That was basically all I knew. I want to talk about work hard. Like even in a town, well, especially in a town with only 35 people, you know, W2 jobs are probably somewhat limited. Uh, like <laughs> yeah. what, what does work hard look like? Um, I mowed lawns for everybody up and down the valley. I picked up a Wilton wedding cake, decided to learn how to make cakes and started selling them. The school we went to was an hour away. So I even, I made the graduation cakes for the school each year, made birthday cakes. And then later on, when we were in a bigger town, started selling wedding cakes just to earn whatever I could doing whatever was available. This is incredible. I mean, you just mentioned like five or six incredibly viable, essentially side hustles. What is, what is the age range on these? Like when are, when are you tackling these different projects and what inspired you to do that? Where did you get these ideas from? I don't know what age I started mowing lawns, but by age 14, I started selling uh, decorated cakes. I got the idea an aunt had come to visit and she, you know, made a cake and I thought that was cool. So I figured I'd learn how to do it. And that was in the small town. Once we moved to a bigger town, then I, I basically did any job. I did a roofing job. Anything that came up that needed to be done, I would I would do it. <laughs> we, I, there's just something you said there, and I want to go back to this, because it doesn't strike me that you are like the person that learned all this on YouTube in 2012 or something like that. You said, you know, I saw that and I learned how to do it. How, how did you learn how to do it? I mean, and, and not just with baking cakes, but roofing, all these other skill sets that you were willing to tackle. Where did you go for this information? So for the cakes, I went down and I bought a Wilton wedding cake book and it has instructions in the back. So I, you know, that's the old version of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I learned from the instructions in the back and just uh, practiced at home. And um, when I started selling, then I started reinvesting some of it in cake equipment, pans and stuff like that. And it paid off. It was a, a good side hustle. For roofing, I learned it on the job. They asked if I wanted to do it. They showed me how to do it, and I did it with them. Bonnie, when we spoke with Alan Donegan from Papa Business School, he talked about creating these side hustles with essentially minimal or no downside, actually proving it out by getting sales. I'm curious if you could bring us back, because this wedding cake thing is fascinating to me. You're a kid at that point. You're 14 years old. You bought this book, but you still have to buy ingredients. You still have to make the sale. You have to prove to somebody that they should have their wedding cake made by a 14-year-old kid. How do you actually do that? <laughs> so I started selling birthday cakes and graduation cakes first. I was probably 16 by the time I sold my first wedding cake. First, I would make cakes and people would see them. The school I was going to trusted me and hired me to make their graduation cakes, which was great advertisement. As far as investing in it, it was really a, an easy... I didn't buy the ingredients until I had a job to do. So I knew the money was coming in for it. And as far as wedding cakes, if someone ordered a round one, that's when I bought the pans. So I didn't buy the equipment until I needed them. And then the ROI going forward was better because I already had the equipment. So every cake, I didn't have to invest more than what I was getting for that job. As a kid, I didn't know all the rules about having a certain kitchen, things like that. So I don't know if that, it'd probably be a little bit different today because you'd have to have inspections on the kitchen. I didn't know any of that. And I was just making them out of the house. This is really inspiring. And I'm curious with the side hustles that you have put together and you're kind of stacking them one on top of another, what are you doing with this income? Are you, are you just buying new round cake pans and it's always just back to even, or are you able to save any amount? Like what, what are you doing with the, with the income from these businesses that you've created? Any income, I saved 90% of it. Even with cakes where I had to buy equipment, there was always a profit on it. So I saved 90% of it and was able to pay for three and a half years college and got out debt free. During college, I got some W-2 jobs and stuff, but I did get out debt free. So Bonnie, you grew up at half the poverty level, but didn't realize it. You had this nice upbringing and but you realized, hey, I need to save for college. How early did college come into the sphere? Like, was it always your plan? Did your parents go to college? Talk me through the actual thought process for college and what you hope to get out of it. I think college was always my plan. It was always the expected next step. I never thought about not going to college. I knew that college could set me up for a much better income later. Uh, no matter what I was doing, you know, I could learn a lot there. And it was kind of expected 
in our family as well. My mom did not go to college. My dad went to a couple years. But from the moment I earned my first dollar, I started saving because I knew that college, you know, my, my parents wouldn't be able to help with college. And if you're coming out of school debt free, I mean, we've talked about with many people starting from broke compared to starting heavily in debt, it feels like an advantage, right? In fact, with people in their 20s, we've seen it. If we can see someone that's graduating college and starting at zero, man, that's powerful as opposed to starting with a mortgage worth of debt without an actual house. In your case, like I know that your story has some ups and downs in it, and it's not a straight path to financial independence. What happens after college? Yeah, so I wish I could say the story started from broke there, but uh, (laughs) then I got married. I was young, didn't know what I was doing, didn't know what questions to ask, and immediately ended up in mountains of debt. I had no idea how much debt the man I married had at the time, but the creditors started calling over the next few months and, you know, realized that we were just, I, I, I don't even know right now. I tried to look for the numbers to share here, but it just felt like, you know, an ocean on top of us of debt. So you grew up with no debt, you graduated college with no debt, but yet here you are with a significant amount of debt. What does that feel like? Did you ever have a conversation with your husband at that point? Like, what's going on here? I mean, did you have any sense this was even possible? (laughs) No. See, I guess I grew up kind of naive. I thought everyone paid their bills. (laughs) It's not something I even thought to ask about before we were married. And then all these creditors came and, you know, there was reasons for everything. And he grew up in debt and not paying bills. And to him, that was normal. So I don't think he ever thought to bring that up either. You know, we had totally different backgrounds and he thought that was normal. And I had no idea people lived like that. (laughs) So it was quite a surprise and it felt horrible to have all these creditors call and have no idea how many more we're going to call and how we were going to get out of debt. And it sounds like, based on the way you're describing it, you move from being cash flow positive, if not having a significant net worth, to basically quite literally being able to just barely afford the payments from one paycheck to the next. I mean, quite literally, not to resolve the debt, but just be able to make it from making the minimum payment on one credit card to the next paycheck. Yeah. And there there wasn't even enough to make the minimum payments on everything. And we went winter time without heat, ice on the walls didn't always have enough for groceries. It didn't feel good. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure there are people in the audience, many who can relate and others who this is completely foreign to them. So your husband had mountains of debt, as you describe it. There are all these creditors, but like, do you have any plan? Like, okay, we need to prioritize the heat first. Talk me through, like, if you can place yourself at that point, like, what do you do when you're inundated with these calls, when the heat is shut off? What do you actually do? And effectively, even more importantly, potentially in your case, when you're the only person that actually cares about improving the situation. Yeah, that did make it difficult. So the first thing I did was just, I love spreadsheets. I didn't know anything about spreadsheets at the time, but I had a piece of paper and pen. And The original just, spreadsheet. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and just started writing everything down, trying to figure out, okay, this is what's coming in. Where else can we work? What else can we do? what needs to be paid first. I basically listed it off by, okay, this one's the highest interest. Let's just chip away at this. You know, I asked, and he's my ex-husband now, but I asked him if he'd sit down, let's go through a budget, talk about this. And he didn't want to talk about it. He grew up, you know, without a lot of concept of money. And I think it was fearful for him and he, he wouldn't talk about it. So, you know, I'm trying, and I know there's many in the forums that talk about, you know, trying to do it on their own when the spouse is not on board. So, you know, I feel for them. <laughs> I know what it's like. So I started with the highest interest and I started playing some credit card games. I would get all kinds of offers for credit cards. I don't know why they send offers to people who can't pay them, but we all know how that's what happens. And I would get you know, 0% for a year for balance transfers. And I use that as a way to put some of the highest ones on there. And my thought was, if I can just hold them off for a year and hold off what I could, and that that worked. And I, I would hide those credit cards because at the same time, I'm trying to pay them off 
the ones that my husband had, he was still maxing out. I was actually going to ask you about this. So as you're trying to make this progress, I guess the term for this is financial infidelity. You're trying to come up with a plan, but right around the same time, is he continuing this behavior that's accentuating the problem, even as you're trying to come behind and clean up the older archived cards? Yep. So, you know, my bet was always, you know, try to pay off as much of the card as I could. And I found out that that didn't really work because if I paid off, you know, $200, it would be maxed out again in the next bill. And so I quickly realized that's not working. So I started paying just the minimum on the cards that he had. And I tried to get him to talk about it and he wouldn't. So I don't promote the idea of doing things behind your spouse's back, but he wouldn't talk about it. (laughs) So what I ended up doing was just paying the minimum and I would save on the side. And when I had like $500, I would send it into the credit card immediately call the credit card company and say, can you lower my limit by $500? And that was the only way I was able to gradually get them down. And he he had no idea that the limit was lowered or anything. It took a long time to get things under control, but eventually did get the credit cards paid off and started making headway on the debt. Wow. Can I just just pause on this? When we talk about resistance, you're fighting through not only the debt, but a partner that is actively fighting you on this, actively trying, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to make things worse. And all you had to work with was a pen and a piece of paper, right? I mean, you don't have advanced Excel yeah. sheets. How much credit card debt are we actually talking about here? I, I wish I knew. I, I tried to find, I don't have any of my old records. This was, we got married back in 25 years ago. <laughs> it was more than I could imagine. It was, you know, thousands of dollars. I, I don't remember how many thousands Plus, there was collections on old electric bills, cars, all kinds of stuff, and his college. Can I just at least pause on this and just say, like, you actually paid this off? Like, you actually, to the degree, I'm not saying that all things worked out, and we know the story's going somewhere else. But in this one instance, with frankly what sounds almost insurmountable, you got back to even? Is, Is that fair or at least close to fair? Yes, we did. Yeah, that's amazing, Bonnie. And and before you said that you felt for people whose spouses are not on board. And obviously, this is an extreme example where your spouse is actively fighting you, in essence. Are there any takeaways or lessons that you can pass on or do currently pass on to, let's say, younger people in your life who maybe are trying to get their spouse on board, people that you see in the forums or even in your real life? Have you ever had that conversation with anyone? Um over forums, I have. Uh, The first thing I say is before you get married, no matter what situation you're in, do a credit check on each other, pull a credit report and sit down and talk about it. Not about gold digging. It's about making sure you both understand financials the same way. Everyone knows the statistics. That's the number one reason for fighting. You know, at least make sure you both understand and know what you're getting into. You know, if you at least know what you're getting into ahead of time, maybe it won't be so devastating. And have agreement where you want to go together. Yeah, everyone knows that finances can be one of the biggest struggles in a marriage. And being on the same page and maybe even having agreement on cleaning it up together before you get married. Because if you don't, you may not be compatible and maybe don't get married. Bonnie, what you're highlighting, you're saying this as a cautionary tale because you've lived this out. This is kind of someone that identifies her childhood as being kind of naive. I thought that people paid their bills. And the sad reality is, and maybe it's honestly, it's a responsibility of society at large. Financial literacy is not distributed evenly around the country. And when you have someone that this is just what you do, you just don't pay your bills. Nobody pays their bills. Who pays their bills? If one person walks in with the understanding that it's A and the other person walks in with B and you never have that conversation ahead of time you can end up in a very dark and dangerous place. But what's amazing about this and the optimism that comes through is that you are an example of someone that comes out the other side, but it sounds like in your case, it doesn't happen in the context of this marriage. And yeah, Bonnie, that's what I'm most curious about. How can this even be something you can talk about, right? When your husband at that point is fighting against you, but you're doing what is really a miraculous recovery. At that point, you've paid pretty much everything off. Do you have a conversation with him? Do you Tell him you have to stop. How do you talk to him after you've done what really is a miracle? There really wasn't a lot of talking, not about financials. It it was not a welcome conversation. Basically, what I did is I canceled the cards and 
I had a few in the safe that he didn't know about. And I, I'm not advocating hiding things from your spouse, but you know, I had a few for emergencies or whatever, but basically we didn't have conversations about it. And of course that's not a good thing. And that, and for many other reasons is why, you know, the marriage ultimately didn't work out. And so, you know, when I hear people talking about their spouse doesn't want to talk about it, I get that there can be fear, but the spouse that maybe is not on board or doesn't want to talk about it, I understand that there can be fear related to money, but be open to talking about those fears. If I went back and did it again now, I think I would just ask about the the fears in the background. I don't know if it would have worked or not, but you know that could be a starting point. I, you know, I think that anybody who listens to this understands the predicament that you found yourself in, and even while rooting you on as the hero in this story, realize that the path that you're on currently in your current marriage, the way it is now, isn't sustainable. And it seems like at some point you had that same realization. What happens, and where do you find yourself when you decide to exit? So we had gotten out of debt, but the marriage just continually every year got got worse for many reasons. And yeah, I hesitate to say I'm the hero. We were both naive in that marriage. We both had faults, but it got pretty bad on many other fronts. And I ended up leaving in the middle of the night in fear. We were still at zero. So I, I had no money to get another place. I hesitantly call it homelessness, because I found a roof over my head. But basically, I left and I thankfully had a good job. And I ended up staying in the office overnight. No one there knew, but there was an empty office. <laughs> so I waited for everybody to go home, went into the empty office, and that's where I slept at night. And uh, the building had showers. I got up, sat there, was ready to work in the morning before anyone got there. Best commute I ever had. <laughs> but, <laughs> Working from home, quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I had to wait for, you know, an, a, a paycheck to come in before I could then find an apartment. Um, I found a little half size trailer. It, literally, you know, when you think of a trailer, it was half the size of a normal one, just enough to fit a bed in. So I, I got the trailer. It was a Memorial Day weekend, went and got everything I needed on garage sales for like 40 bucks, got a bed, silverware, chair, a tiny little almost manual wash machine, basically everything used from garage sales. And I started with that. I just want to point out when I listen to your story, even to this point, I, when I hear like you just telling us your story, my immediate thought is this is a woman that can do anything. This is a woman that can make the impossible possible. And this is a, essentially a humble beginning right here, this new beginning that you've started. But in my mind, from right here, from where you are right now, the rebuilding begins. Yeah, I started with nothing, but you know what? I felt so good in that tiny little dumpy <laughs> trailer because there was no anger in that trailer. I had nothing, but I knew I had, I could start again. Yeah. And you had a roof over your head. You had a stable yep. job and yeah, you weren't in that, that negative environment anymore. So that's amazing, Bonnie. I'm curious about the living in the office. Really, nobody had any sense. How long did that go on? It, it doesn't sound like it's all that long, or maybe two to maybe a month or less, something like that. Yeah, it was only two to three weeks. And literally, I, <laughs> I didn't want to tell anyone. Did anybody find out? <laughs> I had one friend from work in another state that I told. In fact, there might be friends from work listening to this now that are just finding out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and picking up for nothing. So you're rebuilding. You're starting from scratch. And for the first time, you're excited. Like this, this story, we've kind of passed this peak and you're saying, I'm starting, you know, I'm no longer 15 years old. I'm going to have to start from scratch a little bit later on in life, but there is a path from here. Walk me through this. How old are you now? And what is your path back towards this financial stability? So I was 30 when I left. Basically, I was just happy to have peace. <laughs> I wasn't earning much at the time. I think uh, my salary at the time was maybe 25000 maybe 30000 My college degree was in psychology for counseling, and I just needed a job that could pay the bills. So I got the job before I left the marriage and just started as a temp on a help desk for an IT company. I knew nothing about IT, but I had time between calls, so I tried to learn what I could and started learning Excel fell in love with it. <laughs> a slight when, upgrade from your pen and paper techniques. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
then got hired into a reporting job that was all manual and was able to automate that to only take two hours a day. So I had hours every day to start learning <laughs> macros and everything. So I basically learned on the job. I would just ask other people around me, you know, what's this? How does this work? And they'd show me and I'd sit there and play with it. So it was basically, I had playtime when I first started that job. And that's how I learned IT. And that ended up being the company that I had a career in. From there, it it went up pretty quickly and just got more and more financial jobs or tasks within my job. And I, I know you talk about the need for college and stuff like that, but honestly, my college degree wasn't in IT. It wasn't in finance, but I did become director with an IT team under me. So it, it can be done and it, I learned it on the job. Yeah, Bonnie, you are the prototypical talent stacker. You mowed lawns, you made wedding cakes, you learned how to roof on the job. You had a psychology degree and you took a job as a temp and then you automated your job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's truly that like the, I'm the type of person that can learn anything. Wow. That's amazing. And where does your talent stacking go from there? I'm sure based on the little that I know from you from these 30 minutes, like it's onward and upward from here, right? Yeah. And I loved my career for so many years because it was continually changing. I was always getting new things to learn. You know, one of the areas that was given to me, they gave it to me because no one liked it or understood it. And it was all about tracking finances for mainframe CPUs. I'm like, what's a mainframe? So, you know, I had all kinds of Googling to do, but I loved it. I was not looking for another partner. I was done with that. <laughs> I met my current husband at that same company and we just started getting to know each other. We're friends. Everything progressed from there. You mentioned a few minutes ago when you're getting into a relationship, having some of these money conversations, and you're basing that on this past experience that was just so toxic. I'm curious with your new husband, is he have a similar mindset and view with regards to money? What was his credit score? You know, those sorts of things. Did you have these conversations ahead of time? I wasn't looking to get involved in a relationship with him because <laughs> I, I wasn't interested in going there again. But we became really good friends. And as friends talked about a lot of things, he grew up in Philippines and was not a very wealthy family. So he had a frugal mindset. You know, when we did things, I could tell by, you know, what he would buy or not buy. And we just had a similar mindset as far as, you know, spending money or not spending money. I don't remember sitting down specifically to talk about money, but it certainly came up as we went out and did things together. So Bonnie, at that point, you have a friend at work, right? And, and you guys are, are becoming friendly. You're talking about these things and you weren't looking for a relationship, but obviously you've cut to the, the end story. You guys got married. Yep. And you do have similar money mindsets, whereas in your first marriage, there was this person actively working against you. I'm curious if you can contrast your current marriage and just talk about the teamwork and how that's helped you get to where you are today. Comparing the two, it's just an entirely different world. <laughs> Almost every aspect. We're both frugal. Neither one of us really care about fancy things. We both like the outdoors. Uh, we both enjoy experiences and it just seemed to mesh and fall together. And almost, I mean, he's entirely different personality. My husband is a very calm person. I think one of the things that cemented it for me is we were on a road trip and in Tennessee, a drunk driver hit us and totaled the car and no one was hurt, but the entire back of the car was, was crunched up. My husband, Trinity, he calmly got out, took a look at it. You know, we had to call the cops. Nobody got upset. It was calm. We drove over to Walmart, got some duct tape and duct taped the car back together and drove home. <laughs> <laughs> it really and, does fix anything. It Amazing. Does. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a check for the car. We loved that car. So he put a jack in the trunk and jacked it back out and for $500, got it back on the road and it was a little crumpled in the back, but we loved that car. And I think just the the entire, you know, trouble doesn't have to be a disaster. And I just loved the way he handled it. And to me, that was one of the big turning points. I was like, okay, I, I could I I could see being with this person. Yeah. 
Wow, Bonnie, sometimes I hear these quotes and they just light me up. Like, trouble doesn't have to be a disaster. What a brilliant, brilliant quote. And doesn't that just highlight how you can look at life with a positive mindset? You guys, sure, you had this issue, but people, you guys weren't freaking out about it. You just figured out a way to move forward. And I, I absolutely love that. And I suspect that's a theme throughout your marriage, right? Yeah. And if we look back at your marriage, and in particular, the, the span between 30, where it, which essentially is your starting over point, and now you, you've reached financial independence. You guys are no longer working for money. I don't know if you, you know, it sounds like with your kind of entrepreneurial bend and I can do anything mentality, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you did something again, but you know, we can get to what you guys are actually doing now, but you have 13 years, you're starting from scratch and you're not making a six figure income. How do you guys get to the point by 43 where you can basically say, we want to work, we want to explore, we want to focus on traveling the world and experiences together. What is our path to financial independence? The one thing I did want to talk about is the income level. And one of the things that I hear in the forums is, you know, it's so hard to, to get out of debt on low income. And I, I know it can. And that's one of the things I wanted to highlight is that getting out of debt on the low income did happen. It was possible. Now, once I got out of that and was free, then I focused on my career, then the income did started going up and did end up making six figure incomes. So that part, it was just much easier after that. But what I wanted to highlight is it wasn't a six figure income that got me out of debt. The pastify, the most difficult part of it is getting out of debt. And I hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, I don't want to sacrifice to get the fi or, you know, I don't want to live on rice and beans. You don't necessarily have to. I think you should live a good life. You should enjoy your life. But if you're in serious debt, that's a crisis. And you might have to have <laughs> rice and beans for a while. It's like climbing out of a well. You have to get out of the well. Getting out of debt is the hardest part. But once you get out of there, it does get easier. So if somebody's discouraged with debt and getting to FI, it gets so much easier once you're out of that well. Because you're talking about this continuum, right? I mean, it's like, it's not binary, FI or not FI. Every single additional paycheck, every single little bit of space you get between that paycheck to paycheck cliff, it gets easier and you get more power, which yes. means you're allowed to lean on that power and create a life that's more exciting and more beneficial, closer to the one that you actually want to live. It's just kind of like, it's not this all or nothing mentality. And I think you guys, especially now that you have this partner that's working with you towards this goal are seeing that. And I'm curious with that newfound power, with that teamwork, what projects and activities, what money-making plans did you work on together to speed up your path to financial independence? First of all, neither one of us, I'd never heard of the FIRE movement. I really didn't know much about financial independence, neither did he. In fact, I didn't even hear the term fire until after we retired. <laughs> but what? Um, what? We, <laughs> yeah. Don't you know the fire is spreading? <laughs> it is spreading. That's why I've heard about it. <laughs> I had no goal to ever retire early. I figured that I would work until I just couldn't work anymore. But we both lived frugally and we saved just because it was the thing to do. It wasn't because we wanted to retire early. I was loving my career. And we found a level of living that was comfortable for us. And we just stayed there. And the way we had our finances set up, I like to automate everything. So we didn't really even look at the money very often. The bills were automated and our paychecks would go, you know, a certain amount to housing fund and then a big bucket for everything else that we would spend and everything else from the paycheck went to savings. So when we got a raise, we didn't even notice it because it all went to savings. So every raise was going to savings and it just didn't affect us. You know, the boss would say, oh, you got a raise. That's great. <laughs> and we just found a, a comfortable level of living. And before we knew it, we were saving about 75% of our income. We loved our jobs. And until the last couple years, a lot changed in the company and it became a very hostile environment and it wasn't fun anymore. And I kept hoping it would get better because it had been such a good company. And Trin and I sat down, Trin's my husband, and said, we need to find another job or, or do something else. This is no longer you know, the place for us. And it didn't feel like it was a valuable use of my time. Uh, the money didn't matter. It just wasn't a valuable use of my time. I didn't feel like I was 
providing value anymore because of the environment. So we sat down and then we were like, well, let's maybe take a year off and travel. And so we sat down, looked at the numbers and realized that we could just simply retire. So we gave our notice. We gave them a four-month notice and said, we're, we're going to sell everything and we're gonna just going to take off and travel the world. And it was interesting to see the reaction of people because I, I drove an old Honda Civic that was gold with a blue door. And Did it have duct tape on it? No, it didn't have duct oh, tape. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a different car. And I would park next to the BMW and I'm sure they thought I was terrible with money or who knows what they thought. But then, you know, we say, hey, we're retiring and taking off the travel. And we're like, the blank stares we got was wonderful. <laughs> The thing that I loved about financial independence is I didn't plan to retire, but because we were saving, we had the freedom to leave a bad situation. And I think that is really the crux of this movement is the freedom to make changes that you want to make, whether it's to start your own business or whatever. Before we retired, I know you like to ask about side hustles. You know, we had the savings and we were maxing out our 401k and we're like, what do we do with this money? We can't just like let it sit here. So we decided to start buying foreclosed homes. We would fix them up ourselves. YouTube is great. It could teach you how to do anything. Thankfully, it was now YouTube time to, to <laughs> I learn was thinking from of the that. cookbook you were finding somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we moved past the books, got to YouTube, and we would spend weekends at the homes and fix them up and started renting them out. So right now, that's what we're living off of is rental incomes from the homes. And we have property managers that manage it because there's many times we're off the grid for far too long. And, um, you know, we spend maybe five minutes a month talking to the property managers and they take care of everything. Wow. I'm sure there's some landlords that are thinking, we really need to figure out how to scale down our time commitment here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> five minutes a month. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Let's do that. <laughs> that's amazing. So Bonnie, these... Yes. <laughs> These houses, was this part of the plan or is it just something you fell into? Like, did you already have that 75% savings rate? And then you said, all right, let's go into foreclosed houses and build our little, I don't know how many you have, but mini empire of these houses. Talk me through the thought process of that. So we were already at the 75% savings and our savings account was getting large and I didn't want to just leave money in a savings account. It wasn't, didn't look like a good place for it. So that's when we started discussing what we wanted to invest in. One thing my dad always did say is they're making more people, but they're not making more land. <laughs> so land is a good investment. And just going on that, we purchased all of the foreclosures with cash, then just started fixing them up. So it, it came after we had a large savings and we're just looking for something to do with it. So just going back to your savings rate, you said we saved because it was the thing to do. And I think you're collective paths inform that. And, and that's wonderful. But you reach FI before you had any sense that the FI movement even existed or the 25 times or the 4% rule or any of this other stuff. Talk me through how you had any sense that you were at a point where you were at financial independence. How does that even come into someone's thought process when you grew up poor, you're just saving money, you're living your lives, right? Like you don't know about the financial independence blogosphere. How does this even come into your life? Yeah, I didn't know anything about the 4% rule, the 25 times your income. I didn't know any of that. I, I found out about that after we were already on the road. The numbers we had were bigger than I ever thought about as a kid. Like I didn't think I'd, we'd ever reach, like I'd ever have that much money, but it just, it accumulates when you save it. And we looked at it, we looked at the income from the rental properties and thought we could live off of that. And we, we weren't sure if it would work or not, but we figured we were ready to leave our jobs. We might as well try it and see. We knew we had enough set up in our 401ks and retirement for retirement itself. And we thought, well, let's just live off the rentals until retirement age. And then, you know, we can sell them if we want, but still not knowing about this movement or any other people that did it. We did sit down with a financial advisor and we're like, are we crazy? Can we do this? And he said, you absolutely can. You know, we got that confirmation from someone else. The thing was, we didn't know if it'd work or not, but we figured, what can it hurt? We're leaving these jobs anyway. Maybe we take a year, few years off. Maybe someday we go back to work. At this point, we don't plan on going back to corporate America. I love being busy. I love still learning and doing things, but we retired without knowing all those numbers. 
you know, you said your financial advisor, when you asked him if you could do this, he said yes. <laughs> and I bet you he said yes, in large part because you have a 75% savings rate, regardless of your income level. And I'm, I'm assuming you guys aren't making $500,000 a year. You have a 75% savings rate. I'm curious for our audience that's maybe just listening to that and is kind of incredulous. Can you help fill in some of the details? What gives you a 75% savings rate? What constitutes your structural expenses? I don't need every single line item on your budget, but if you can think about what really moved the needle to allow you to hit that savings rate, I think that would be really valuable for our audience. So hitting 75% savings rate was never a goal. We didn't actually sit down and even talk about how much we wanted to save. We talked about what we were spending. We didn't see the value of having cable because we never watched it. We were working too many hours as it was. We had Netflix. We didn't go out to eat much. I'm blessed with a husband that cooks really well, and I prefer his cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so we ate at home a lot. Having both grown up without a lot of money to spend, um, spending exorbitant amounts of money on entertainment and stuff, it just it didn't sit right with us. So we loved what we were doing and how we were living, but we just didn't spend a lot. It was just kind of in our DNA, I guess. So we didn't talk about the savings, right? We just lived, I felt a a comfortable life. Now our friends making the same might think differently, but it was certainly comfortable for us. And I love how you said before, it accumulates when you save it. Like it's that's, just, just math, Brad. <laughs> just math. Come on. <laughs> that is like the most succinct way of saying, wow, compounding is amazing, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. So you've reached this point now where you're not happy in your jobs. You are at financial independence, almost unbeknownst to you, and you guys are picking up and starting a new chapter. Like, tell us about this new life that you're living, the name of your blog and how it ties in. Like, I, I just want to hear about, about what you're up to now. So we both love travel. We both love experiences. So how the conversation started is he said, you know, if we retire in Ecuador, we don't need as much money to live on. And I said, well, we've never been to Ecuador. Why don't we go see it first? Then it was like, well, if we're going to South America, let's see all of South America first. I'm like, well, let's just check out the world first and then we'll decide where we want to live. <laughs> so that's kind of how it progressed. And um, we just decided if we're going to be traveling a lot, there's no sense keeping the house we were living in. Um, it wouldn't have been a good rental property and all of our stuff. Why put anything in storage? So we just started selling everything off. And it was an interesting experience selling off all of our possessions. We started with the things that we weren't using, probably should have sold off a long time ago. And so that was a good feeling. But then when it got to the sentimental things, I was like, man, can I get rid of this? As it started going, it felt like freedom. You know, We all know that all these things weigh on us, but actually feeling all of that stuff go and being free from it, you know, we're living that difference. And I never understood how big of a difference having less stuff makes. And it's, it's just a, a freedom. There's not a lot to worry about. So we sold everything and got a one-way ticket to Costa Rica and started from there. Slowly, we travel very slowly, making our way down through Central America and South America. Somewhere around Peru and Bolivia, someone pinged me and said, hey, have you ever heard of FinCon? I'm like, what's that? And they, they introduced me to it. It was based on one of the, the articles I'd written. Then I saw Reddit and it was, they were talking about fire and F5. I'm like, what is that? And so I started Googling and figure out what this is. I'm like, there's a name for what we did. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a tribe. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's um, in your forum is actually how I met your brother. And I was looking to meet somebody on the road. I'm like, is anyone in South America here? And so while we were in Chile, we stopped by in Santiago to see Scott, your brother. And it was kind of exciting, like meeting the, you know, the first one from our tribe. <laughs> <laughs> and the that's... world just got smaller. <laughs> 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 oh, man. This, Bonnie, this is, this is so much fun. You guys are on this giant adventure. You made some incredible choices. And starting basically from the age of 30, you were able to get to a level by 43 years old that I think many people are aspiring to. Many people would love to have reached this level of financial stability, this level of financial independence. Tell us a little bit about the namesake you write at 43bluedoors.com. Where does that come from? When we told everyone at work we were retiring, they always asked, how did you do it? My husband always responded, well, we drove a gold car with a blue door. It was about the choices we made. 
I loved that car. It was dependable. I could reach everything because I'm short. And that's really how we did it is we didn't buy expensive cars. We, we saved our money. And I started blogging really just for fun, for friends and family. They said, make sure you tell us, you know, what you do and how it's going. And in the midst of doing that, I found out that writing is a passion. I found out I just, I love writing the blog. So now I have a new technology to learn. And about a year in, I decided to monetize it. So I have to learn all of that stuff. It's a lot of fun learning it. Still have a lot more to learn. But we continued with the Blue Doors theme. It's 43 because we retired at 43. But Blue Doors is kind of morphing into our theme. The blog is really about freedom. You talk very often on your show is about the mindset and freedom really is about the mindset. There is financial freedom, freedom from hate, freedom in the way we think. So my goal in writing these is it's travel stories, but also I try to bring up things to help us all think a little differently. If you think a little differently, is there a little bit more freedom in the way you think and in in your life that you can achieve? Maybe not everyone will retire early, but there's little things you can do to make tomorrow better. It's never too late to make tomorrow better. That's basically what it's about. So I monetized it because in Ecuador, we met this brilliant man who grew up on the streets and ended up dedicating his life to create a shelter for a safe house for girls rescued from human trafficking. It's all about freedom. So we decided to monetize the blog and anything that comes in income from the blog goes towards supporting that home because it really is all about freedom. Awesome. And just for our listeners, one more time, if they want to connect with you and connect with your content and your mission, what is the best way to find out more about what you're doing? 43bluedoors.com. Awesome. Well, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I am. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, Trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation. These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Bonnie, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. So I know a lot of people give financial blogs. I'm not going to give a financial blog. Oh my goodness. One of, <laughs> one of my favorite blogs, and I have been following her for many years now, is jilloutside.com uh, by Jill Homer. And the thing I love about it is she loves the outdoors, which I do too. But she pushes herself and does amazing things outside. But she she writes like a normal human being. She's done the entire Iditarod Trail on foot. Wow. Um, she she won the women's time on the cycling, the Great Divide race. But yet she writes, she's like, I still feel like a newbie. And she's continually pushing herself. It's a very personal blog. And I just love that blog because whenever I'm on a hard trek, I think, man, Jill could do this. Wow. <laughs> So she's inspiring. I'm watching Brad bookmark this right now. <laughs> <laughs> Literally just opened my phone. I've never heard of that site, but it sounds amazing. All right. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now, this can be one that you wrote or someone else's. So I am going to pick one I wrote because a few things. The article I wrote was called Financial Independence Without Ever Writing a Budget. And the reason I'm going to pick that is when we first started the journey, everyone kept asking me, you need to write and tell us how you reached you know, financial independence. And so I thought about that article for a good year before I was able to get it out. And then the other thing I like about it is that's what led me to the FIRE movement. Someone online found it and they were the ones who said, hey, we read this post. Have you heard about the FIRE movement? And I hadn't. <laughs> so it kind of led me into this as well. And so that's kind of a turning point. Awesome. Well, the community is thrilled that you are here. All right, Bonnie, question number three, your favorite life hack. I'm going to say delayed gratification. I know a lot of people talk about the fear of missing out. Honestly, that's just an excuse. You're choosing what you're going to miss out on. Do you want to pay twice as much by taking out debt on that couch? Or can you sit on a crate for a little bit and pay cash for it and then get something else? What are you missing out on being able to get something else as well? Or 
you know, so that, that fear of missing out is just an excuse. Delayed gratification is so powerful because if you pay cash for something, you pay less. You can also wait for a good deal or sometimes get it free if you wait long enough. My husband and I joke that so many times there's something we need and we just wait. We don't want to buy it yet. Don't want to buy it yet. Needed a new pair of sunglasses. Found a pair along the railroad tracks going up to Machu Picchu. You know, you just... <laughs> I bet you no one else has way. sunglasses that were found on the Mount of Machu Picchu. I mean, these are limited edition. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Well, I would say that's not knowing what I was doing when I got married, not talking about it. And even during that first marriage, not asking for advice from other people on how best to get out of debt. I just, you know, buckled down and tried to do it myself. And it probably would have been a whole lot easier if I had had support. Support for sure. But I got to say, from a tactical perspective, it sounds like you are just dialed in. I mean, the, what you were working against and what you accomplished is something to go back and listen to because there are many, many people, unfortunately, very unfortunately, that are in a similar situation. So well done on your part. Finally, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. So the advice I'd give my younger self, and I kind of mentioned that, talk to whoever you're dating about financials. Make sure you're on the same page. And also, if you're already in a relationship with a significant other that you want to, I hear a lot of people talking about, I want to get to five, but my partner's not on board. I think the advice I'd give to myself is dial back a bit on the goal and say, here's my goals. What are your fears? I tried talking, but maybe I just didn't have the right words to say, maybe get help from an outside person and maybe both sides have to give a little, I think to, to get there and it might take longer to reach those financial goals. But if you have a good relationship in the process, that's worth it. Now we do have a bonus question for you. What is the, now, and this is really cool from someone that doesn't purchase anything. What is the item that you purchased over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? So I made a huge purchase recently that was worth every penny. As we were traveling through South America, I was determined I was going to find a last minute deal to Antarctica. I really wanted to go. When we got close, it was only like a month before we found it was a 22 day expedition to the Falklands, South Georgia and Antarctica. It was expensive, but we also got an excellent deal on it and it was worth every penny. It was amazing. Man, this has been so much fun. I'm curious because you are all over the world with your travels. Where are we talking to you right now and what's next for you guys? So I'm actually in Phoenix, thankfully out of that polar vortex. <laughs> <laughs> so local. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were out of the United States for almost two and a half years. Uh, we left in October of 2016 and we just got back to our first visit back to the United States last Friday. We'll be here about four months just visiting friends and family, and then we'll go off to our next continent. Are you going to get another one-way ticket? Yes. Oh my yep. goodness. You guys are so cool. Bonnie, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been inspirational and so motivating for me personally. Well, thanks for having me. It's great talking to you guys. Brad, as we were recording this episode, I'm watching you take notes and I'm reading your notes right now. And there were a couple things that were said in this episode and, and, and she just said it so poignantly. And one, you know, I, I understand that not all poverty is a choice, but for many, many people, you know, this is a mindset issue. And if you can change your focus, if you can apply action, if you can add good information to your life, you can get a completely different outcome. And, and I know I just watched all these other quotes that you were writing down and I know that you were as inspired by Bonnie's story as I was. Yeah, this was incredible. I loved her focus on freedom in every aspect. And she said, trouble doesn't have to be a disaster. That just really hit me. The fact that they're working together as a team now, her and her husband, and it's a remarkable thing. And they're just living this amazing life and saving money and seeing it accumulate and making the right decisions over a 10 plus year period made all the difference in the world for them. If you got value from today's episode and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us in what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. 
too. Use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free. And just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.